grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And welcome to Wycliffe. Youth, I want to let you know I am excited to get to know you, and I hope you will stop by on August 3rd at Sweet Frog right across the street and come for ice cream and conversation with me. I'm looking forward to getting to know you. And children of the church, I'm also looking forward to getting to know you as well. So join me for Vacation Bible School on August 7th through the 10th at Lynn Haven Colony Congregational Church. Together, we will go green with God. Every atom proclaims your glory, from the smallest creature to the highest mountain. The valley sings for joy, the hills skip the lambs. And though we seldom notice, all of creation daily performs a symphony for your delight. We are also the work of your hand, so all with nature we sing. The Gospel lesson today is taken from chapter 13, beginning with verse 24. Jesus put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the house Soldier came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in weeds you would uproot the wheat. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Ends our scripture lesson. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Jesus and Almighty God, we give you thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, all the things that he said and taught. Thank you for his parables as sometimes complex and confusing as they are. Give us wisdom to hear his word today. And now, in the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts, pleasing and acceptable in your sight, you, O Lord, our rock. Amen. Well, Jesus never said. We know many things that Jesus never said. Some are things maybe Jesus had said. Some are things, well, we know plainly that Jesus uttered. Worst of all, though, are the things that we might think that Jesus said, but he Things like God helps those who help themselves, or people get what they deserve, or everything happens for a reason, or everyone should act and believe just like me, or just like I do, or just like we do, or just like you do. Another, you have to be sorry to be free. Jesus never said. He said so very many things, and this week something that Jesus never said that often is either misquoted or pulled in partial context. Money is the root of all evil. That wasn't Jesus who said that. 
In fact, that's not even in the Bible. Well, the words are. But you've got to put the whole sentence together, you see. Paul, the love of money is the root of all evil. Jesus didn't say that. Now, Jesus thought about money. Famously, he says, you can't serve God and men, but never does he call money evil. Now, the gospel lesson takes us to a time in Jesus' teaching where he is using parables to teach. They become his primary mode of communication. So just a parable. Well, Tim Beale notes the story metaphor that brings together an unfamiliar idea and an everyday situation. So we know metaphor two two things that are seemingly un we could say God is a rock. That's a metaphor. A parable might look more like this. God is a rock on which a storm tossed ship crashed and splintered to pieces in the night. The people on the ship survived clinging to its sharp edge. The next morning when the sun rose in the clear blue sky, they all gave thanks for their lives. That story shift metaphor brings together these unrelated instances, this, you know, I don't know that a shipwreck is an everyday situation, but a situation that we know happens. Parables Notoriously difficult to parse, tease meaning out of because they have multiple meanings. They are rooted in the times that they were spoken, that Jesus lived in those times. They aren't impossible to understand, but we do best with parables. We make with the fact that parables are both disturbing and much richer than we first give them credit for. Parables also resist a single, straightforward meaning. The largest concentration of parables is in Matthew chapter 13. They come kind of right after another. It's all they're strung together. Now, the first parable in Matthew chapter 13 is the parable of the sower. For most of us, it's a somewhat familiar story about a sower who throws seed in the air without rhyme or reason, and then what happens to that seed? Some lands on a path, some lands on rocky ground, some lands in thorns, and finally some in good soil. Now, the interesting thing about the parable of the sower, of course, is that Jesus explains it to his disciples after they're away from the cloud where he first spoke it. And when the parable of the begins, there's no large introductory comment about it being a parable. Jesus launches into it with the crowd that's gathered around him. The disciples say, why do you speak in parables? And Jesus says to you, it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. And he explains the parable. And his explanation, well, it seems simple enough. There are four places that Jesus describes the seed falling. In the first, the evil one snatches the seed, the bird that takes it away. In the second, on the rocky ground, the root is shallow. And in the third, the thorns choke out the growth. And in that explanation, actually, we see, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the care of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word. It yields nothing. Lure of wealth. It's an interesting phrase. It sounds to me like in this particular parable, Jesus explains, he even mentions that the lure of wealth sometimes can choke out the goodness of of the seed that's growing and prevented from thriving. And 
seed that falls in the good soil, well, that one yields many, 60, 30, 100 fold. It yields many good fruits. See, love of money, as Paul names it, the lure of wealth that here, it's one of many things that can, things that can distract, that can cause us to discard and seed or prevent germination. I do want to mention the parable of the sower. There are other things we might hear too. We might hear. That what's being sown, the seed that's being sown, is called the Word of God. Right? That's what it says. Jesus notes is being sown, the Word of God. And if you've read much of the New Testament, perhaps what comes to your mind is the beginning of John's Gospel, where we're told that the Logos, the Word of God, is Jesus Christ. And in that case, the sower is not Jesus sprinkling the seeds around, but actually God broadcasting seeds all over the earth. The Word of God has been spread. And perhaps this parable begs for us to say, well, what kind of soil are you? I'm sure I preached that sermon before. But I think the parable, the more I read, the more I examine. The different purpose. God has spoiled the word all over the world. And as God sprinkles the word, it lands where it will. And many options are in front of of the word and God really is more concerned with the word being planted everywhere so we come to this place where of our own way to allow the seed the word of God to germinate and grow and once we do that, well, then we're on pretty good footing. See, one parable says this. In the end, the parable of the sower does indeed call for a response from us. It's not to fertilize the soil of our lives. The response is to be one that is appropriate to bearing fruit, not accomplishing some kind of work. The goal that this parable sets up for us is not the amassing of deeds, good or bad, so the amassing of wealth, but the unimpeded experiencing of our own life as Jesus Christ abundantly bestows it to us. No wonder love of wealth might get in the no wonder the lure of wealth might distract. If our point in the middle of the is to experience the full abundance of God's grace through Jesus Christ, and we somehow believe and act in our lives that something else is greater than that, then we're going to be in big trouble. Of course, our headline parable today might even be slightly more strange. It's the parable of the weeds and the wheat. And in this case, we have another farming example. It's a farmer who sows good seed in his field, and while he's sleeping after a good day's work, an enemy comes and sows weeds among the wheat. Well, that seems pretty straightforward. Again, until Jesus offers an explanation. I do have to say, I kind of think of this parable a little bit differently as I think about my garden at home. Or I might be better suited to call it a weed patch. But I have planted some things. And as they have 
grown seed to plant. I'm always excited. Nowadays, I go to the eye, I take a picture of whatever is growing, and look up, use that little feature where it is that's growing. I said, oh, that's pretty. And then I read, oh, that's pretty noxious and invasive. Hmm. Well, do I pull it or not? I probably should, but it looks like rain, and I've got three places to be, so it can wait. And then as the things grow up more, it's hard to, to pull out these pulled because it's pretty well woven in with the flowers at this point. So I decide to wait. Now, on the one hand, that puts me in good company with the farmer, our parable. But that farmer, it certainly appears, as Jesus tells this parable, doesn't really know well how to run a farm because you can't let the weeds and the wheat grow together. Because when those, when those weeds get to harvest time, that's when the farmer wants to separate them. When they get to harvest time, they've already dropped their seeds in the soil, and you're going to have a bumper crop of weeds next year, too. Of course, the weed that we understand was sown in this parable was the bearded darnel, which looks very similar to wheat, but is clearly not wheat. The parable, in many ways, is about what we do when things don't go our way, when evil comes, when an enemy has done something. When the servants come and say to their master, I thought you sowed good seed. We have weeds everywhere. The master simply answers, an enemy has done this. He doesn't go down a rabbit hole of why the enemy did this or how it happened or anything else. An enemy has done this, is all he says. And the slaves look back and they say to him, Well, do you want us to go and gather it up? No, don't gather it up. You'll uproot the wheat along with it. So in this whole parable, which is six verses long, five and a half verses talk about the weeds and the wheat growing together and the farmer doesn't do anything about it. In fact, he permits them to grow together for permit. The Greek word is the word that means permit or let, but it also means forgive. Forgive the weeds for now. Forgive them. Let them be. Hmm. We'll separate later. And it's not until that very last half of the last verse of the parable where he speaks about let both of them grow together until the harvest. And then in this last little section he says, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first and burn them in the fire and then take the weed and put it in my barn. Hmm. Farmer makes a decision. Now he could have and to try to pull out the weeds and the wheat at that young stage of growth. In which case, the very well of one, because in that instance, the serpents would carry an order to clear the field of the weeds, and as they do, they up the wheat along with it, and the whole crop is lost. The farmer wants what there is. And the parable is both about grace and judgment, about mercy and judgment. But judgment is so small in this parable. A decision point is often required by the gospel in various ways. Much later, Paul writes his letter to Timothy and says the love of money is the root of all evil. He's telling Timothy that there is a decision to be made. What will come first? Will it be the love of money or will it be the love of God? Jesus says much the same thing in Matthew 6. When he says, you cannot serve God mammon. Now, 
both of these parables, the sower and the parable of the weeds and the wheat, Jesus is trying to get across what the kingdom of heaven is like, what something is like that we have so much trouble understanding, much trouble envisioning. I think the disciples that are with Jesus, they keep looking for explanations of what's happening on earth. And when they do, they ask Jesus to explain what he means, but a clearer picture, but they can't get out of their mindset of what's here and now. They get, as probably we all do, stuck in the moment, maybe even stuck in keeping score. But that's a distraction. Keeping score, especially in these parables, because we the judge, we're not the scorekeeper. We aren't even the jury in the kingdom of heaven. Those disciples may be like and barely stand for the grace that Jesus offers. Parables, along with all of the others, sometimes make us scratch our heads. They serve surprise. But Jesus never said he didn't come to disturb and surprise. He uses parables to talk about the kingdom of heaven to help us think about what he's doing here on earth in a different way. This past weekend I was at a wedding. At the wedding I had an email that asked if I would do a an unplugged announcement at the very beginning. I kind of wondered what that meant, visions of an MTV show, but the announcement was really to remind people to not be distracted and be present in the moment as this couple was making for God and all of the witnesses gathered. So the announcement was to put your phone away. I had some trouble figuring out what to say that didn't sound rude. I ended up starting with Sarah. And so I said, we got here in the name of God. For the marriage of this couple. Please unplug yourself from all electronic distractions and fully attend to the covenant being made between the Bride and the groom. It's hard for us to pull ourselves out of the world of distractions. Love of money is a distraction that leads us far from God. Long before the parables were uttered, in Matthew 6, during the on the mount, Jesus said, You can't serve God and mammon. Mammon, of course, meaning wealth or riches. Years ago, when Christianity was coming to Europe, it's said that rulers sometimes led whole armies through rivers and baptisms. As the story goes, some warriors went into the water with their right hand held high. They kept their right hand dry. The soul could belong. God, but the unbaptized right hand could wield a sword as freely as before. Is there a time in which that all of us was not fully committed to Christ? Is there a part we want to hold back like Ananias and Sapphira whose story is recorded in Acts who go to give the sale of house to the community, but they hold back some, struck dead. Money isn't evil. Money is evil. But our attitude is distorted. Does it distract? Does it interrupt? Over Does it occlude our ability to know, love, serve, and respond to God? Bearing fruit in his name. Jesus 
Jesus never said, money is the root of all evil. But let's not forget, money can allow us to produce fruit for the kingdom. If its lure and our love of it overtakes our faith, then it might have us bound for fire. Let anyone with ears hear. Amen. Let us pray. Merciful and gracious God, you have sent us your Son, Jesus Christ, your most magnificent gift of grace to lead us in life abundant. Give us courage to follow him and accept his promises. Give us wisdom to know what he has said and what he has not said. And remind us, in all we do and say, you may be glorified. Keep us from supplanting Christ in our life with all of the material things that surround us. Let us not fall victim to a love of money, a lure of wealth, or a choice to serve mammon. Instead, keep us steadfastly bound to you through your Son. By the power of your Spirit, bless our lives over and again. We pray for all the places around this world that are rent asunder by violence and fear. We ask that you would help to build them up in grace and truth. Let men and women of good courage and conscience carry the day. Gracious God, we remember those within our community, our friends and neighbors who are sick and who are hurting. We ask you to bless them. Hear their prayers just as you hear ours on their behalf. and Make us to know your joy deep within our soul. Your grace and your mercy your forgiveness and your love are wider than we can imagine or think. Help us to bear fruit in all aspects of our lives and bearing fruit for you. Help us to confidently live in your peace every day. We pray for our community, for this commonwealth, for our country, and indeed the whole world that is your creation, O oh God. Help us all to be good stewards of what we've been given. Help us to hear your words, even as you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My friends, as you go out 
into the community this day. Remember, Jesus never said that money is the root of all evil. But we all ought to attend to every distraction that lures us and interrupts our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Go in, Jesus' loving embrace, into the world and share God's good news with all you meet. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance towards you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mm -hmm.